Dr. Richard Sims is Chief Economist at the National Education Association. He previously served as Policy Director for the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy in Washington, Director of Applied Economic Research at the Carl Vincent Institute of Government at the University of Georgia, Chief Economist and Director of Taxation and Economic Policy for the Arkansas Legislature, and Director of the Office of Economic Analysis for the Kentucky Legislature. Legislature. In addition, he served two years as the Senior Advisor for the Pol of, to the Parliament of the Republic of Moldova. Dr. Sims has authored over 100 publications on taxation, economic growth, and regional development, and applied public finance. He has served on the boards of several professional organizations, including the Executive Committee of the National Council of State Legislatures and Chairman of the Economic Development of Committee of the Assembly on State Legislatures, the International Fulbright Fellowship Program, and President of the Kentucky Economic Association. He has worked with scores of business, civic, and governmental organizations, and has conducted and presented policy studies in over 40 states. Dr. Simpson's teaching experience includes graduate courses in economics, public finance, Finance, public policy analysis, and organizational leadership at the University of Kentucky, Kentucky State University, the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and the University of Georgia, and the University of Moldova. Uh, talking to him, it's very easy in the course of a five-minute conversation to mention he has just uh, had uh, was with Reich, the, um, the the great economist at Berkeley right now, or having been at the White House last week. So it's it's a very broad spectrum of experiences that are sure to enlighten us tonight. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Sims. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> My father still can't believe it. I owe all those accomplishments or achievements or whatever to hay. One day when I was uh, 17, I was hauling hay, first day of August, about 107 degrees. And at the end of the day, after a 12 hour day, I remember sitting down the last bale of hay on the wagon thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna do when I grow up, but it is not going to involve hay. <laughs> and so I did everything I could do to make sure that I didn't have to haul hay for a living. I bought the farm, though, just in case. You, you never know how things are going to turn out, so if I have to go back to Harlan Hay, at least I'll own the farm this time, not be making 75 cents an hour. Uh, first off, thank you very much for being here this evening and for having me up here. I really appreciate this, and it's quite an honor. This is an institute that I'm really excited about. I see great things coming for it, and for your role in it, this is something that can be transformative for Maine, and can have an impact on some national decisions. Groups like this uh, have more influence than most people can imagine because great ideas that are transmitted to uh, the community can be transformative, and I think this, this group will. I wanted to talk to you briefly about issues involving the future of education. And Today, in particular, you can't talk about the future of education without talking about the future of the economy. Education is such a big part of the economy that, in fact, it's driven by the economy and it drives the economy. You can't separate the two. You can't have a high-quality education system without having a high-quality growing economy to support it. And, on the other hand, there's no example of a high quality growing economy that doesn't have a high quality education system. So the two are interlocked. Today, more than any time in my lifetime, the path for both the economy and the future of education is less clear than it seemed to be in future years. We're seeing major transformations in the economy that we haven't seen before, and that's filtering directly down to education. A quick uh, sort of a snapshot on education. Education funding, and when I'm speaking of education for the moment, let me address K-12 education, what we call, commonly call public education. That is funded mostly by state and local governments. 
The federal government has never put in more than about 9% of K-12 funding. Most years, it runs more like 5 or 6%, with the remaining roughly 94% coming from state and local governments. In some states, it tends to be mostly a state function. In other states, it's more local function, but on average, it's about half and half state and local. Now, within the part of education that is funded by state and local governments, that vast majority, the 90 plus percent, the biggest single source of funding is the property tax. Something around 38.5% uh, of school funding comes from property taxes national average. You're a little higher than that. A concern that we have right now with the education funding side is that some of you may have heard this kind of been a housing crisis. When there's a housing crisis and housing values drop, that's going to affect property tax revenues. Well, from the second quarter of 2006 until the most recent quarter, housing values have dropped something around 33% national average. One third of their value just disappeared. Well, that's the major source of property tax revenue is home values. The other component of property tax values being commercial real estate, and if you've been following the business news, commercial real estate is just now where residential property was about two years ago. It's just starting to fall off the cliff in value. Well, the interesting phenomena is that so far, up until about last quarter or maybe one quarter back, property tax collections were going on fairly evenly without declining much. The reason being, there's about a three-year lag on average, sometimes a little more than that, between the time your home's value goes up or down and the time your assessor comes along, sometimes a year or two years later, and the time that assessment is turned in to uh, the state or to the local board of appraisal, before the full process goes through and the time you send a check in to pay for your property tax is on average something around three years or more. Well, we're just starting to see the beginning of the decline in property tax. That's that roughly one third of education funding is starting to go down. Uh, that's going to put more pressure on the other sources of revenue. Well, as far as the other sources of revenue, the next largest source is the sales and use taxes, mainly the general sales tax, just like you have uh, here in Maine. That's the second largest source of education funding. That has been declining substantially. A bit of background on that, over the last 10 years, consumer spending rose at its fastest clip in U.S. history. When consumer spending goes up, sales taxes, which are based on that consumer spending, go up. Well, the reason that the sales taxes went up and the reason consumer spending went up was consumers were spending every dime they make plus a few. Uh, when we started the decade of about going from say 10 years back to now, at the beginning of that, consumers were saving around 5% of their income, spending about 95%. By 1997, they were spending about 103% of their income. Now, some of you in the room might be like me and say, what's wrong with that? I've always spent more than I've made. Uh, in fact, the average American started to spend more than they make. We had negative savings. Well, that, from a tax standpoint, that's good in a temporary sense because it means people are spending a lot, it's generating a lot of sales tax. Well, with the crash in the economy, that's going to change. One big factor is people for the last decade, there might be somebody in here, that took money out of their house in the form of a home equity loan and used it for some consumer purchase. Uh, most television sets larger than 50 inches were purchased on a home equity loan over the last 10 years. Uh, the Auto Dealers Association reports that something around half of the cars so new cars sold over the last 10 years 
involved somebody taking some money out of their house and converting it in to a new car. Well, that's good for car sales. It's bad for your home value because you've taken your value out of that. And you can only spend your home equity one time. Well, we spent it that one time. And to give you an idea of the magnitude we're talking about, over the 10 years before the recession began, say from the beginning of uh, 2007 back 10 years, consumers took out $9 trillion out of their house and used it for consumer purchases. So this large part of our consumer purchases came from your house. To help put that in context, the last year before the recession, the, the amount that was taken out of home equities and used for consumer spending turned out to be 12.5% of total consumer spending that year. Well, the follow-up from that means that that money is gone. It can't be spent again. You can only spend your home equity one time. It was spent in those years. It's not there anymore. Home values have gone down, plus you spent what equity was there. Consequently, you don't have as much money to spend for consumer purchases in the future. That trails back to the sales tax, saying that sales tax collections from this point forward are going to be pretty grim, not going to be near as strong as they have been in the past. The remaining component of uh, education funding, and this applies to state government funding in general, is the personal income tax. Well, personal incomes went up rapidly during the economic expansion, with a large part of that growth occurring at the, at the top ends, coming from financial investments, uh, people at upper income levels, making a lot of money, going up rapidly. That drove sales tax collections up. We got used to spending that sales tax that was rising very rapidly each year, and then all of a sudden the bubble burst, and that money coming from the top as well as all the other income categories, all the people that now are laid off and don't pay income tax when you don't have a job, that declined very sharply, very dramatically, and is likely to continue flat for a long time to come because we're not going to see the growth in personal income that we saw during the bubble. That's sort of the definition of a bubble is when income rises at rates faster than the economy will sustain. Well, we got over that. We had this big bubble burst. We're not going to jump into another bubble. At least we hope we're not going to jump into another bu bubble. That's my fears that we would, but I, I'm pretty sure that we're going to, it'll take us a year or two before we forget about the last bubble. Uh, anyone that lost a job, lost a home, uh, will probably take a couple of years to get over that. We'll, we'll go into another bubble sometime, but hopefully not soon. Well, put in those three sources of revenue, if you, by the time you take the property tax, the sales taxes, and the income taxes together, that's all of education funding. All three of those have a fairly grim future as far as being able to fund at the level they funded in the past. So that says state and local government funding generally, and education funding in particular, is on a downward trend based on the decline in the base of those taxes and unless we increase the rates in those taxes so that we can return to a higher level of collections, we'll see a decline in the ability to fund education. Now, higher education is experiencing its own uh, dramas around the country. Uh, tuitions have been going up on average nearly three, per, three times the rate of inflation. You can only go up three times the rate of inflation for some period of time at which point you're taking all of people's money. You can't increase faster than anything, than everything else, and just keep doing it year after year. So higher education all across the country has seen, uh, in general, massive cutbacks. It's, it seems like here you've been doing extraordinarily well relative to other institutes of a similar nature. I forgot to turn my phone off. <laughs> Now, 
a, a concern that we we have extending beyond simply the tax structures themselves or the basic economy. Uh, I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago with uh, some economists who were saying, well, the economy is in recovery now. The recession is officially over. Officially, the economy turned around last August. We haven't dated it for sure yet, but that's what most of the economists that date such things say. Does anybody in here feel like that they're, they've recovered? Uh, Yes, the economy in terms of the big numbers like GDP have turned around. Well, let me ask, who in here knows how much GDP they earned last year? Uh, you know whether you had a job last year. You know what your personal income was last year. You probably know how much investment that you had in your 401k or other savings last year you probably have no clue of how much GDP was assigned to you last year. I don't have a clue, and if somebody told me what it was, I wouldn't believe it anyway. Well, the big number, like the GDP, I'll accept, since I don't know what it is, if somebody says it turned around, I'll agree with them. The things that concern me individually and people who are concerned about education funding is jobs and personal income because that's what drives funding for education is when people are working and have an income and are, are paying taxes that means more revenue to fund education in the future that's what concerns us and that's what i'm afraid is not turning around anytime soon uh, a, a quick point to make on that if 1999 was a good year for you congratulations we're back in 1999. We have the same number of people working today, actually a number fewer, than were working 10 years ago. The total people actually employed is less than it was. If we start turning the economy around now, today, and if the economy goes back to growing at the pace it was growing from the last recession, which was in the early 90s, until this recession started, it will take us until 2016 to get the jobs back that we lost during the recession. That's with no growth in the population. That's with no increase in the workforce. That's just saying to get back the number of jobs that we've already lost it will take us from now until the end, actually December, of 2016 to get those jobs back. That's a long stretch. Now we could grow faster than that, but we also could grow slower than that. My concern about growing slower, well, studies have that looked around the globe at recessions for the last uh, several decades, if not centuries, have found that recessions that are caused by bank failures and financial recessions, like the one we're in now, grow a after the recession's over, the economy grows about half the rate it does after other recessions. So it could be even slower than what I've projected for 2016. That gives you a grim outlook for our ability to fund education, for the number of jobs being created. It says that the economy could be in, uh, in the doldrums for much longer than most analysts are currently calling for. That's my, uh, that's my dark side coming through on this. Uh, and it could be that we have some persistent effects coming from this recession. When people lose their jobs and they stay unemployed for a long time, the skills tend to deteriorate. When there's no demand for people's services and people have to ratchet down, even though you're, you're still employed, maybe you're employed in a job that doesn't fully utilize your resources, you don't swing back to your higher paying, higher skilled job as soon as the economy turns around. So those are some of the things that have us uh, thinking towards the, the grim outlook for the, the long term. I looked in particularly at public revenues over the next few years. And I get, from my calculations, about $700 billion in 
public revenues that would be available to fund public services that won't be there, that just evaporated because of this recession. That means education funding, that means roads, schools, bridges, all the things that we value, there's going to be less of to the tune of about $700 billion. That's a very, very substantial amount of, to take out of the economy because of this economic downturn. That means when you have uh, roads with bigger potholes in them that you don't repair, that means when your schools are overcrowded, uh, that means when you have shorter school years, that has this persistent residual effect that's going to carry out through, throughout uh, years to come, many years to come. Uh, an area that we've been paying a lot of attention to has been the flattening of our educational attainment and what this means for the economy. This chart uh, shows some numbers that we had looked at, looking at the growth in the U.S. economy for the last, excuse me, for the 25 years following the Second World War. For those 25 years, starting in 1947, for 25 years after that, the economy grew at its fastest rate in history, a very rapid pace, and all income categories, families in every income category, grew at about the same rate, 4.2% uh, average with very little variation around that, regardless, regardless of whether you were high income or low income. For the 25 years starting in the mid-70s up until uh, 2005, the growth was just over half of what it was during the first 25 years after the Second World War. And people at the middle and lower ends of the growth, or, or, excuse me, of the income distribution, had much, much, much lower growth than did those at the upper end. All the growth was concentrated at the top end. In fact, the average working male, age 35, today earns 12% less than a comparable working male age 35 did 30 years ago. That's not the direction that you want your economy to be going in. Why? Well, some characteristics of the period of the rapid growth in here. Following the Second World War, we had just enacted the GI Bill. The GI Bill sent all of the, the service members that had been in the war, regardless of what your rank was, regardless of how long you were in, you got to go to college or whatever level of education you wanted to do. If you wanted to learn how to fly a plane, the government would pay for it. That led to a rapid run-up in education, and it was matched at the state and local level with the largest increase in education funding that we've ever experienced in our country. Well, if you believe that higher education, higher levels of education and educational attainment lead to higher earnings, that was the test of it. And in fact, it verified that each year we saw substantial increases in educational attainment and substantial increases in earnings power of individuals. That drove economic growth to a very rapid pace. <clears throat> Starting uh, around the early 1980s, we saw a flattening of educational attainment and of educational funding. We spend about the same amount per pupil in K-12 education today, adjusted for inflation, as we did 30 years ago. Uh, similarly, on higher education, we spend about the same amount per pupil as we did 30 years ago. Our educational attainment is almost unchanged over the last 30 years. From the end of the Second World War forward, we had a huge increase in average educational attainment of our workforce. Uh, in 1940, the average, uh, on average, across America, 4% of the population had a college degree. By 1980, that had jumped to about 24%. Today, we have about 24% unchanged over the last 30 years. 
That says that we're not improving our ability to earn, compete, grow into the future. We had that period, that, that test we ran, we did this empirical lab test that said when we increased our investment in education, increased our educational attainment, we grew and grew very rapidly. Now we're experimenting the other way. We're saying, okay, we're going to flatten out our investment in education, consequently flatten out our educational attainment. Uh, what, are, what do we expect is going to happen? Well, what's happening is this flattening of income, earnings, uh, productivity, all the things that you expect when you stop adding to your education. The big concern that we're facing right now is uh, do we stimulate the economy anymore? You know, we had the, f first we had the bank bailouts with the TARP program, the 800 million that went there. Then we had the economic stimulus package of roughly a similar amount. Uh, now the big concern in Washington is about the federal debt and deficit. And all economists are very concerned about that because money that you pay out in, in debt is money that you don't have to spend on something more more productive than paying off debt. But for all of us that have been through college and had a student loan, we also know that some debt is better than some other debt. I get a higher return on my investment in my college education than I get on the debt that I incurred on my 1967 Camaro back in the day. Uh, the Camaro is gone, but my education theoretically is still there. I looked at debt as a percent of GDP over the last, well, basically since the beginning of time. The beginning of time that census kept records was 1790. We started as a nation with a fairly high level of debt, about uh, just over 30 percent, which came about because of borrowing to become a nation to finance the Revolutionary War. But after about six years after the end of the Revolutionary War, we had cut that in half, and then it continued to drift downwards for the next several years. Then we have this spike. The spike, incidentally, is the Louisiana Purchase. When we bought Louisiana, which was actually this undefined mass of land that was somewhere south of the Ohio River and somewhere west of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, it, it was totally undefined, which is one of the issues at the time. The people said, you know, we, we have no idea what we're buying. We don't know where it is. Plus, it's costing us uh, this huge amount of money. The amount of money it was costing, incidentally, I just recently ran some numbers on that to see what that was in today's purchasing power. The Louisiana Purchase cost the equivalent to $50 million in today's buying power. Uh, roughly what one bar in New Orleans would cost, we bought the entire Louisiana Purchase for. Uh, but that was a big debate at the time because there was concern about this was going to run us into debt. It, was, it more than doubled the national debt. We weren't going to be able to pay it off. It would ruin our credit rating in the international community. Uh, we had all the arguments that you're hearing today. But as you see right after that purchase, within about uh, 10, 12 years, we cut it down to about half of what it had been because when we bought the Louisiana Purchase, that doubled the size of the nation. And it turned out that some of that purchase was actually productive land. It, it paid for itself over time. And that continued. We paid that down, and we essentially went debt-free for a large number of years up until the Civil War ran up uh, debt again, got up to uh, better than 30, 35 percent of uh, GDP. Then in spite of the absolutely worst economic policies you could envision, you know, some of you might remember the Marshall Policy after the Second World War who went into Europe and tried to get it uh, mobilized and get the economy up and running. After the Civil War, uh, the national policy was exactly the opposite. It was to keep the South down. Uh, you'll know from my accent what my position on that is. <laughs> uh, we didn't think much of that. But in the South, they essentially 
had a national policy after the Civil War that the South wasn't going to have any economic power or political clout again for as long as they could keep it down. Well, in spite of these policies applied to roughly one half of the country, and in spite of the debt incurred during the war, as you can see, we ran that down fairly rapidly. And within uh, 18 years after the end of the Civil War, we'd paid the debt down to about half, and it continued to go down until the First World War, where we shut it up again. Well, after the First World War, we also paid it off within about six years. Because of economic growth, we had good economic growth during that period. It wasn't that we paid off the debt directly as much as it was that debt as a percent of the economy went down because the economy grew. Same thing happened uh, after the, uh, excuse me, here we had then the Great Depression kicked in. And there we were trying to stimulate the economy by massive public projects that ran the debt up to the highest level we had seen in history up to that time. And before we actually got out of that recession, or of that high debt level, we had the Second World War, which then stepped it up to its all-time high, hitting 100% of GDP. Was, was, uh, th that was the debt equivalent. And I'm using the term debt in the terms of true debt held by uh, the public as opposed to some terms that you'll hear where there's some debt where it's the government holding its own debt. I'm not counting that because figuring debt that the government owns itself is kind of a wash. But this is debt held by the public, hitting 100% at the end of the Second World War. But then notice that it fell just as steeply as it increased. And again, that was in large part because the economy took off rapidly at the end of the Second World War with the GI Bill, with the, uh, the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration giving loans to build housing for construction, uh, getting into the 50s, then we had the National Defense Highway Act where President Eisenhower built the interstate highway system. All that stimulated the economy to the expense that even though all of those things cost money, the debt went down. And it was because the economy was growing. The economy outgrew the debt. And that continued downwards until uh, roughly uh, in the mid-1980s when we had the only increase in debt that wasn't associated with the war up till that point. Uh, we had some massive tax cuts that weren't funded, and so that ran up debt, which continued for uh, quite a stretch of time. Then uh, we had some increases in some in taxes that came under uh, President Clinton that dropped that down by about half. Uh, it declined for about six years and then took off again. And then now uh, we have, I guess you could say war-related debt. We have t two wars going on that uh, go into the debt category. I guess we're still paying for the war on drugs. I'm not sure. Uh, but my, my conclusion from looking at the history of our debt is that, yes, I'm very concerned about debt and deficit, but we've been through this before, and we have worked out our debt and deficits before, and if we spend wisely on things that matter for growth, uh, the highway system that Eisenhower put in, the education system like the GI Bill and what the uh, state and local governments invested in after the Second World War, uh, after the Civil War, one of the big contributors to the decline after the Civil War was the uh, increase in the, or not the increase in, but the passage of the Land Grant College Act. We passed the Land Grant College Act during the second year of the Civil War right when you know, the, the worst time to increase funding for something like education, right in the middle of the nation's greatest war on its own soil that we've ever had, we passed this program creating this land-grant college system that turned into be one of the best investments the nation's ever made in terms of getting its money back. Uh, the, the GI Bill has been estimated by Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors Chairman to return 
$7 for each dollar it cost. That was one of the best investments that the federal government's ever made. Uh, so all this to say that it's possible to go into debt and to outgrow the debt. Just like personally, many of us incurred debt to go to college, but we outgrew the debt because our income went up enough to be able to pay for it. Our nation has had a track record of doing that. Uh, many other nations have as well. It, it's possible to not have that outcome. But if you invest and invest wisely, that seems to be where history suggests you could lead to. Now, we're still very worried about the near-term debt. We're worried about getting the economy going again. Should we, uh, should we pass some stimulus measures to get things working? That's not uh, an, an easy, clear outcome, but it does say that if we, if we try to cut back on our debt just for the purpose of cutting back on it, we risk cutting the underlying growth factors. Now, we're talking about education primarily here, so let me give you a number that what the World Bank is using right now when we ask the question, what's the return to taxpayers on investment in education? The World Bank, which is holding a meeting on this issue next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in D.C., currently says that a taxpayer in the U.S. that has a dollar taken from them, and being from Kentucky, I always use the image of the, uh, the curmudgeon on the corner. Do you have any curmudgeons in Maine? The, the, the old guy who uh, has the fence around his yard and the little sign that says, you know, stay off my yard and the the mean dog out there uh, hates kids, hates teachers, thinks uh, all public servants are overpaid and lazy. When that curmudgeon on the corner has a dollar ripped out of his hand and spent and spent on his public education system, the World Bank says he gets back a 14.3% return annually on that dollar. Compare that, if you will, to what he would get if he put it into uh, the stock market. What if he put it into the stock market 10 years ago today, his return would be zero. The long-term average, the 50-year long-term average return on money put into the stock market comes out to about 6.5%. Well, money that he gets from his dollar that goes into education comes out about double that amount. Let me explain what that return is. Part of that return is because when the people that get funded by his dollar receive that money, that goes into educating them, that increases the money invested in them in the terms of smaller class sizes or higher quality teachers or better schools, better books something to make them a little more productive. When they're a little more productive, they earn a little more, they pay a little more in taxes. When they pay more in taxes, the curmudgeon doesn't have to pay quite as much. That's part of it. The bigger part of it is when people are educated more, when they have more money invested in their education, in public education, the cost associated with them, the public cost, goes down. People with lower levels of education tend to do things like Oh, use the local emergency room as their first stop for health care services. Well, the local emergency room is the most expensive health care delivery vehicle on the face of the earth. That's not where you want people going, but that's where people who have lesser education don't have alternatives. They don't have insurance. Uh, they don't have the knowledge and training. That's where they go. Uh, similarly, for things like corrections, Go to the uh, Portland jail sometime on a scenic tour some evening, if you've got nothing else to do, and do a little, your own little census take to see how many people in there have less than a high school diploma. Well, on average, it's about 85%. People with high school plus tend to prefer not to go to jail. Uh, for people with less than, you have to conclude that jail must be their preferred place to spend the night. Well, that's an expensive place to house people. You hate people going to jail if for no other reason than because it's expensive. You'd be better off putting them up in the Hyatt Regency every evening than you would in the local jail. It'd be cheaper. That's a cost you could avoid if 
they have more and better education. Uh, we see a lot of incidental factors. Low birth weight babies tend to be a function of lack of education. That uh, we see the same thing on uh, young mothers. Mothers with uh, more than three children when the mother is less than 20 years old, or excuse me, 20 years old or less, is inevitably going to be a mother who has less than a high school diploma. Uh, smoking. Smoking is associated with lack of education because as soon as you pass your English class, you're able to read that warning on there that says, this is going to kill you. And so you give up smoking. Uh, a lot of the things that have high social costs are functions of lack of education, lack of educational investment, and lack of educational attainment. So when the curmudgeon, again, has his dollar spent on education, he tends to benefit in ways that he will never see, but that in fact keep his taxes lower than, he, than they would otherwise be and allow him to have public services at a higher level than they would be had he not paid those initial taxes to begin with. Uh, I want to wrap up with a qu quick look at kind of the post-stimulus as, as the stimulus money runs out, you know, there's talk of an additional stimulus measure. I don't get any real feeling that it's going to happen. So we're seeing a post-stimulus world now. One thing I want to mention about the last stimulus, when the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House met two weeks ago, and they presented their annual report for this year, the, the first Obama annual report of the Council of Economic Advisors, the first question that uh, Christina Romer, the chairman of the council, was asked was, what part of the stimulus package were you surprised at and what worked? And she said the biggest surprise was how powerful the money going for state and local governments was in keeping jobs and income going. That turned out to be the part of the stimulus package they said worked and worked very well. Uh, Many of us actually thought it would going in. That's why we supported that measure. But it turned out in, in hindsight that that was the strongest part of the stimulus package. Going forward, state and local governments are facing years of continued recession. That's true right here in Maine. It's true in your neighbor states. It's true across the country. State government deficits for 2010 are greater than they were, were for 2009, and for 2011, they're expected to be just the same as they are now. And for 2012, they'll probably be just as bad again. There's nothing in the pipeline over the next, say, three years that's going to cause state government's revenue structures to change, to start producing money again. So we're looking at some long-term persistent uh, crisis and the need for restructuring. Uh, unemployment, as I indicated from my projections, and I'm, I'm a little more grim on the job front than some economists are, but I'm seeing jobs as being uh, persistently below historical average for a number of years to come. Wages and personal income are going to be flat because there's not the demand in the economy for workers to be able to argue for and receive higher pay. Uh, consumer spending is going to be stalled for a long time to come because people ain't got no money. You just can't spend it if you don't have it, and they don't have it and won't have it for quite a while to come yet. Uh, housing that went through this 10-year fantasy land of increase, I can speak with authority because I own a house in Nevada. Uh, we saw housing prices going up an average of 18 and 20 percent a year for about a 10-year stretch. And we all thought we were some smart son of guns. And then all of a sudden, we all lost about 50 IQ points when the houses just went straight down. You couldn't sell them at any price. They just went straight south. Well, if we think back in the 10 years before the housing bubble, 
the average annual increase in housing was about 2.9 percent, just about the rate of inflation. That's what long term you expect housing to go up, about the rate of inflation. We had this one little period of, uh, of Treasure Island when housing just accelerated like mad. And it was a smart thing to do. But people who had no jobs and no income could go out and buy a half million dollar home and make a half million dollars off of it. Uh, it was a crazy world. It came to an end. It won't come back anytime soon. Businesses are not investing because banks aren't lending. We gave the banks $800 billion to stay in business. They took the money and said, thank you, but we're not going to lend any more money because sometimes we don't get paid back. So they're not in the lending business anymore. It's very difficult for businesses to get loans. That's not going to turn around rapidly. That'll be a, a slow drag before we get back into the capital market. And then finally, and very importantly for education purposes, taxes at all levels are going to rise. At the federal level, they're inevitably going up because we spent massively more than we took in. And so we're going to have to pay for it in the future. Federal taxes are going up. Federal taxes, as I mentioned starting out, the feds don't spend much money on education. They talk a lot about it, but they don't really put much money behind it. Well, when the federal taxes go up, every time federal taxes rise, that makes it that much harder for state governors and legislators to raise their own taxes because taxpayers, a typical taxpayer doesn't draw a big distinction between somebody taking their money from this side or from that side whether it's the federal government or the state government, it, a tax increase is a tax increase to a typical taxpayer. So when the Fed taxes go up, as they will, states and local governments are going to be under pressure. Even though they'll have more need than ever, it'll be that much harder for them to increase taxes in the future. Uh, with that, let me take some any questions that might come up. Did I challenge anybody to think of anything that uh, they'd like to rebut? I don't really want to rebut it, but on your chart with the debt, yes, the debt after World War II, we were basically the only country that was left unscathed, mm -hmm. along with Canada, that, that could provide the building, the products to bring the rest of the world back up. Mm -hmm. Unlike now, where there are a lot of other places that manufacture things less expensively than we do. And the other one is you mentioned the public debt, and I'm wondering who that public was, because now we know a lot of the public are not the public in this country, it's governments of other countries, which then affects our foreign policies. The, after the war and for the, through the 50s and 60s, we more or less had a lot of things to ourselves, particularly in the manufacturing sector that was growing at the time. And that was a, a big driver of our economic growth. That in itself was tied to our public investment in things like we would not have had the auto industry run up that we had had it not been for the highway system we put in place. Uh, so the two were, were linked together very closely. Uh, we're concerned going forward about in, you're asking about the debt, where is it held currently? Uh, you know, as you all know, currently China is our number one buyer of our debt, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. I'm not too concerned about China buying our debt because the more of our debt they buy, the more interest they have in making sure we can pay it off. That's, that's kind of the good side. Uh, you know, if, if, if you borrow $100 and you owe the banker, if you borrow $100 million in the banker, uh, you own the banker. Uh, in a sense, the countries that buy our debt are in our, are in our debt because they have a vested interest in making sure that we survive and thrive into the future. Uh, plus, the faster they grow, the more we grow in terms of they're, they're a market for our goods and services. And uh, when one country grows, it tends to be something spread across the globe. Our, our growth after the Second World War caused the growth in other countries. There, there was an interesting phenomena that tales, whether it's the Second World War, the First World War, uh, 
an economist at the University of Maryland a few years ago, Manker Osen, studied 500 years of economic growth and came to the conclusion that the best way to grow your economy was to have a major devastating war on your own soil 20 years ago. That was the point in time when the economy grew the fastest. So look after the Second World War, track Japan, track Germany, track France. They grew very rapidly. Britain, not so much because the war wasn't on its own soil. The U.S. Uh, was not growing as fast a percentage as some of these other countries were, as Japan was at that point. Japan was coming from a lower base because it had devastated its infrastructure. The, the reason being that when you have a war on your own soil, a major devastating war, you destroy your infrastructure, which sounds like a bad thing. You think Katrina. But it can be a good thing because when you destroy your plant and equipment, when you replace it, you tend to replace it with the most current cutting edge technology. That's why Japan passed us in steel production. Germany passed us in steel production. Their old steel plants were replaced with new steel plants that were much more cutting edge. Uh, the Britain's steel plants were not wiped out, so they end up stagnating through the, uh, the 60s because they were still using the oldest technology. So that was one of the interesting phenomena we saw. The economic lesson is to try to figure out how to emulate a major devastating war on your own soil without actually having anybody get shot. Uh, what kind of policies have the effect of getting rid of old infrastructure? That is the driving force behind why we have uh, in our tax code rapid depreciation of plant and equipment. From a financial standpoint, a plant that's depreciated out is worthless to the, to the factory. They're better off buying a new plant. Now, I won't get into the accounting on this, but you don't want a plant paid off. Just like if you're an individual, you don't want your house paid off. Because when your house is paid off, you can't deduct it off your taxes. If you've got a house paid off, the first thing you do is go out and take out a loan on it, because that way you've got something to deduct against and you can use that money. Now that's getting into some heavy finance, but what it means is that you want policies that cause you to continue to be replacing and replenishing your economy, whether it's in your physical infrastructure, whether it's in your workforce. You want new cutting edge ideas, plants and equipment, and human capital. The human capital being the part that we found to be the most important Paul Samuelson, who many of you, if you took economics in college, you probably read Paul Samuelson's book, did his breakthrough study in the mid-1950s that found for the first half of the 19, uh, excuse me, the 20th century, two, uh, two, th excuse me, th three fourths of the growth in the economy were accounted for by improvements in education. One fourth by improved capital, more capital available, and so forth. Uh, two years ago, the uh, fellow that won the prize called the Bates Prize, that's the really outstanding prize for young economists, uh, Paul Romer, did a study updating what Samuelson had found and found essentially that for the second half of the 20th century, right up to now basically, that it's even increased more since then. He gets numbers showing into the 80% range of economic growth that's attributable to improvements in skills, uh, knowledge, and technology that all trend back to saying improvements in your human capital, which is another way of saying in your workforce quality, which you get workforce quality by investing in your educational system. So that's been the big driver for the last uh, roughly century on our growth. I, I believe you cited earlier um, about the last year's labor force being for the first time ever the least educated. Can you expand yes. on that? The OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, Last year released their study, and each year they ranked the educational systems in all of the major industrialized countries. Last year they found 
that students last year were the first students in America to have less education than the class before them, less educational attainment overall. That's the first time that's happened in the U.S. and the OECD says that's the first time that's happened to any industrial country that your educational attainment of your future workforce has not just plateaued but has actually started to decline. Now so far we're working off a, uh, a random sample of one so that I won't say that was a fluke but it might not be a trend. But it scared the pants off me because the implication of a declining educational attainment of your workforce is just too scary to even contemplate because every other industrial nation is increasing their educational attainment and the rising countries not counted in this are the Chinas and the Indias uh, the Brazils the countries that are rapidly increasing their educational attainment year after year they're starting from a much lower base which is great from their standpoint because it's much easier to improve from a low level you can get large rapid increases very quickly and comparatively easily starting from a low level so that says to me our children's competition for jobs is going to be greater than anything any generation has ever seen. And we're not equipping them to be able to compete in the global economy the way other nations are. That should be worrisome to all of us. I'm given to understand that the uh, collapse in the uh, commercial real estate market um, has the same sort of potential for economic dislocation that we experienced just 18 months ago. Do you have the same level of concern about uh, this uh, collapse? It, it's going to be not as bad as the housing collapse because it's more concentrated. It will it will wipe out a significant sector of our economy, but it won't be as, as broad spread, but it will have some, some very traumatic effects. What we're talking about, for those of you that don't follow this on a daily basis, maybe you actually have a life, uh, is that commercial real estate, just like housing, greatly overbuilt for the same reason. Why did people overbuy? Because they could. Why did people buy more house than they needed? Because they could because the banks would lend to you, and when they lended to you, they also lent to your neighbor, and the, their, your neighbor's neighbor, and when everybody else could get money for free, basically, that drove the price up, supply and demand. Price went up. Well, then at some point that bubble burst, and all of a sudden your neighbor couldn't get a loan. When your neighbor couldn't get a loan, you couldn't sell your house. Uh, you couldn't get a loan. That's the same phenomenon that's happening in the commercial real estate market. And in many urban areas, the amount of commercial real estate available is, uh, is just tremendous. And it's going to have a very significant impact on a lot of communities because the communities themselves, if you, if you didn't even like the business sector, you still depend on them for jobs and income. And a lot of the key newest areas in many communities, particularly in rural communities, are being hit very hard by the loss in uh, the commercial real estate sector. Uh, we're seeing this surprising to me in the small communities. The more rural, the lower income your community is, that tends to be where the impact is actually the greatest. And let me say on that because we've been looking very closely recently, when I say we, I'm talking about the research unit where I work, at small and rural communities and what causes them to grow and thrive and what their big threats are. One thing that we found on a recent study that I conducted, I looked in uh, Oregon, Tennessee and one other state, at the poorest one-third of the counties. In the poorest one-third of the counties in these states, the school district was the largest single employer in the one-third of the poorest counties, the school district employed 
one out of every two college graduates in the county. Every other college graduate worked directly for the school system. Well, that has a tremendous impact on the county. And then the other phenomena that we discovered that I wasn't looking for, in the small poor counties, educators tend to have benefits, health benefits and retirement benefits. Few other people do. When we were doing our survey, one of the anomalies that came up was people were telling us that were it not for the health benefits that educators and people who work for the school board get, the health care providers in those counties could not afford to stay there because you've got one source of, of clientele that can pay the bill and the rest can't. Uh, when you lose your health care providers, your future growth prospects become zero. It just doesn't happen. So that was something that was tied to the, uh, the educational spending. It's a phenomenon that we weren't looking for, but it jumped out off of uh, several of the survey responses we saw. Other questions? Appreciate your perspectives on the impact of the economy on the schools, some interesting numbers. But I'm also very concerned with if we invest those additional curmudgeons dollars in the school system, what we do with them. Uh, have you taken a look at the global achievement gap, Tony Wagner talking about the skills that are needed versus the skills that we are leaving our children with when they get out of our school system? And I'm wondering how much of the decline that you just noted is because of that sort of disconnect? You, you lead me down a path that, uh, don't even take me there. The, some of the, the way we're doing our education system, let me just use that term very broadly, is, what can I say and be politic here? Not as good as it could be. We, we know from talking to, to business leaders, we know from our own common sense, what it takes to succeed as an employee, as an entrepreneur, uh, what it takes for our economy to succeed. People who come out of K-12 education with the ability to read, write, think independently, uh, to communicate to work in a social environment, to be able to work independently, to be self-motivated, have their own initiative, to be able to show up to work on time, to have basic work ethic. That's what's needed. That's what we don't do a very good job of getting across because we focus on math and reading. Well, as an economist, I kind of love math, and as a lazy person, I kind of love reading. But if that's all that we have, we don't have the ability to do much. Uh, if you look at the demand for people with the skills of being mathematicians, that's a very small part of the workforce. Reading is vital for everything, but again, if you, if you just have those two skills, without the other things that we don't put such emphasis on. There's no measurement of communication skills coming out of the K-12 level. There's no measurement of uh, work ethic. But I can tell you that business measures that because I've been in parts of the country that are noted for having high work ethic. I was recently in Salt Lake City in that area. Uh, something in the water in Salt Lake City produces a high work ethic. That materializes into an ability to attract business that's recognized. Businesses know this, even though they can't define exactly what it means, they know it's there. Uh, there are parts of the country that are famous for having high work ethic. That is measurable in where business moves to. But by contrast, we've looked down to the zip code level, where business moves and what causes them to move. First thing that comes up is we're looking, what do, do taxes drive growth? Well, what you find when you look at, uh, at taxes, you know, the, the theory is that the higher the taxes, that chases businesses away. When you actually look at the IRS numbers, you conclude that 
businesses want to move somewhere where they can pay more taxes. Well, they don't really want to move where they can pay more taxes. They want to live where they've got better streets, roads, highways, parks, recreation, those kind of things. And it just happens those are paid for with taxes. Uh, when I go on vacation, I'd like to stay in a hotel that has the cheapest rate possible, but I'd also like an air conditioner and a swimming pool, clean sheets on the bed. Well, that costs money, so that means I don't actually go where it's the cheapest place possible. Uh, you know, we used to say years ago that uh, businesses, if, if they located where taxes are cheapest, they would all be in uh, South Dakota. I've been to South Dakota, it's a nice, beautiful state, but I didn't see all the businesses in America located there. They tend to be in areas that are actually fairly high cost. There are more businesses in high cost Boston than there are in, uh, in, uh, in South Dakota together or in Wyoming. Wyoming is the least taxing state in the nation, but it doesn't have all the businesses. So that's not the factor. It's all these other things together, the quality of the workforce. In fact, the Federal Reserve of Boston did a study a few years back. It looked at, I think it was 2,000 businesses and where they moved and why they moved over a 10-year period of time. And they said for what they called new economy firms, white collar firms that were the office type businesses, 77% of the reason they moved from one place to another was because of the availability and quality of the workforce. That's what they moved for. Taxes were about 4%. The workforce was about 77%. Other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's really all about money, though, isn't it? And my, my thought is, how much is enough? It appears that the rich are getting richer and the middle class is shrinking. And so in your talk, you mentioned that the federal government's going to have to increase taxes. I think you said that, didn't you? I did. Yeah. And you know what? It is the answer. And it's, it's the problem, it seems to me, that's uh, being argued out in Congress for national health care. Obama says that he's not going to increase the tax on everybody, but rather on those who earn 200000 or 250000 that, that ta their taxes will go up. Mm -hmm. Now, why, isn't that, why doesn't that make sense to any ordinary thinking person in terms of dealing with, the, with an issue that uh, is vital to our country? We're talking about our health here. And it's got to be paid for. Mm -hmm. So why not have a progressive income tax of some sort? We had it once in our history, but of course, the powers to be got rid of that. But my question to you is, what's wrong with a progressive income tax? It would seem to be, be fair based on income and therefore controlling how much money, how much money possession is enough. Thank you. I think economists from Adam Smith forward would, uh, would pretty much agree that uh, at least a, a tax system that was somewhat progressive is a good way to go. Uh, in Maine, I was just looking at the latest numbers on Maine. Taxpayers in Maine that earn $50,000 or less pay 30% more in state and local taxes. And I'm talking state and local now as opposed to federal. Pay 30% more in state and local taxes than do taxpayers making a million dollars or more. Well, if the taxpayers at a million or more simply paid the same as those at the 50,000 level, that would produce a very large increase in revenue. I won't give you the number off the top of my head, but I used to be a state revenue forecaster when I could actually get in and look at tax returns and things. It's not unusual to see 15, 20, 23, 24 percent of your taxable income occurring to people at the very upper ends. A small increase in their rate can generate a large revenue. Then something to keep in mind at the upper end, if you're one of the fortunate few at the upper end, you face a 35 percent federal tax level. State income taxes are deductible 
against federal taxes. Consequently, you don't have to pay that 35 percent. That goes on to the U.S. Treasury. Uh, it's a good way to get compared to other taxes. When, when Maine taxes, sales taxes, that comes out of Maine residents' pockets, 100 percent, except what you pass on to tourists. But on the income tax, better than a third of it gets passed on to the federal government. So that makes it dollar for dollar. You get much more bang for the buck within the state taxing that tax. Plus, the people at the upper end generally uh, can't afford it. They would typically agree. You know, we have numerous upper income people. Uh, Bill Gates Sr. is a big advocate for higher taxes. Warren Buffett is famous for saying that uh, he pays more taxes than his secretary. He pays all taxes together, he figures 17 and a half percent. There are probably several people in this room that pay more than that in, uh, in total taxes. That's, A, it's not quite fair. B, it's dumb as can be because uh, that's where the money is at the upper end and that's where the growth has been. I mentioned that the a typical 35-year-old male, and I, I picked that because that's kind of the, the classic, women have had an increase over the last 30 years, but it's because 30 years ago, they faced so much discrimination, it's not really a fair comparison to, to show how the economy grew over that time. But for a male, you can figure 35 years ago, uh, excuse me, 30 years ago, a 35-year-old male was doing pretty well Today he's doing 12% less well than he was then. But people at the upper income levels have seen large increases in their income. That's where the growth has been, has been at the top ends. And not to say anything bad about people at the upper ends, we wish, all wish we were there. It's just that structuring your revenue system, that's a good place to put the growth. It does less harm to the economy because when you take money out of the hands of low income people, say here in Maine, your sales tax, or your, your cigarette tax. Maine has a, you've increased your cigarette tax. That's the most popular tax in the country, by the way. It's hard to imagine a tax being popular, but if there's a popular tax, it's the cigarette tax because it's the easiest tax to increase. It's seen as just affecting a small number of people. It's seen as being a sin tax. Uh, as I said, you know, it's, a, it's a tax on people who can't read the label so they probably don't vote. But it has the drawback from a funding standpoint of you're taxing something where you have a dying tax base. That's not a good way to fund education or anything else. You don't want to fund, or you don't want to depend on your funding on something that's not going to be around in a few years and smokers are going to be around in lower percentages than everyone else would be. So if, to the extent that you can shift your taxes to people whose income is rising a, they can afford, if my income goes up every year, I can afford to pay a little more. Uh, I don't need it for survival purposes. People at the middle, you know, I mentioned the $50,000 threshold uh, and down, but people at the 50000 level spend every dime they make, and they tend to spend it locally. They spend in the community. Someone here at the, at the income level of a typical teacher or someone who works in a school system spends every dime they make, and they spend it locally. They spend it in the stores and shops right around where they live. So when you take money out of their pocket, that comes out of the local economy. When you take money out of the pockets of people at the upper end, well, that means to an extent it, it comes out of their savings that they don't spend. It's passed on to the federal government at the, in, in part. And much of their consumption, they tend to be the global travelers, or at least the around the country travelers. They spend much more broadly and for items not subject to the sales tax. I'll point out on that that you don't tax services in Maine. Low-income people don't buy many services. Most people making $25,000 a year don't hire accountants and lawyers. People making $250,000 a year probably do hire accountants and lawyers. You don't tax that service. Uh, I don't believe you tax lawn care and uh, maintenance around the house services. People that live in mobile homes don't have lawn care service expenditures. People that live in mansions do. So th there are many ways that you can fix your local tax system to be more productive. And then whether you're talking local or national, shifting the burden up somewhat, 
you, you never want to say it's a, it's a good thing to do, but it, given your alternatives, if you've got to have some money, that's a pretty good place to look to. Other questions? I have a question on your, uh, your rate of return. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to believe that if you indeed raise the level of education, you'll get a very good rate of return. My question is, how, are you assuming that the, the dollar spent on education will indeed raise the level of education? And if, for example, you ran an experiment and you had two dollars to invest in education, mm -hmm. and you invested one dollar in a school system here in Maine, say Cape Elizabeth, which is a wealthy suburb, mm -hmm. And you had the second dollar you spent on a low-income uh, inner-city school district in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Now, in one school system, you have the majority of the, the students come from two-parent families, the income level is very high, and the, for example, the teachers probably have 15 years of experience in that school system. In the other school system, you have a very low income level. All the kids are getting uh, free lunches. You have most, the majority of the students are from single parent families. Most of the teachers are have two or three years, and then they go to another school system. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to believe that the, <clears throat> that the response would be the same from the dollar invested in the two systems. I'm not sure which system would give you the most bang for the buck, would give you the most rate of return on your dollar investment, but it's very, very hard for me to believe the two wildly divergent systems would give you the same response mm -hmm. and the same input. And it would seem that there was other factors may, may be far more significant in when you measure the, how much you raise the level of education than just strictly speaking the dollar that you invest in each system. In, in answer to that, first, yes, there are wildly different returns depending on how you spend and who own. The World Bank calculation is based on the actual current distribution so that you've got some going to the upper end school, some going to the port. It looks at, at exactly what you actually did, the empirical results of historic trends. And then as far as your, uh, I'll call it a question, which one has the highest return? By far, the highest return is on the poorest performers. A child who has the most learning challenges benefits the most from a one person reduction in class size because they get that much more teacher time. The hardest gains, I used to work, up, I was in Arkansas a number of years ago when Bill Clinton was governor. We were trying to improve the educational system there. The hardest gains, the hardest places to get students to do better was in Northwest Arkansas where the average income looked like Hollywood. All the students, virtually, two-parent families with at least two college degrees. Uh, the, the kids had every kind of resource you can imagine. Try to improve that child's learning. In fact, let me go the other way. Try to reduce that child's learning. To take a child, a typical white child in that case, a white child, two parents, both with college degrees, tried to figure out how much you'd have to take out of their funding before it actually showed up in a difference. They will learn if you put them under a tree with a notebook. They will perform very well. They've got the discipline for it. They've got the expectations for it. They've got the ongoing support for it. They will do well. You, you can't improve it and you can't reduce it because of funding go to the Arkansas Delta. And there, I've, I've been in school systems where 98% of the students were on free and reduced lunch, 98% were from single parent households, 98% were minority students. They had every disadvantage possible. Give me a $100 bill and I can make a difference in the entire class. Little things like the smaller class size means you can make you can make and get across the idea of more expectations. Students perform at that age perform based on expectations. If you tell a kid, okay, if, if they come in and say, well, 
uh, my mother had to work last night. She works at the local Burger King. She had to work and I had to take care of my little sister so I couldn't do my homework. If your answer as a teacher is, okay, I understand, then that child gets the message, the expectation from me is nothing. If the, ex if the answer is when that child comes in and says, well, gives you the story and says, I couldn't do my homework, and your answer is, okay, you're in school now, sit down right here, here's the book, there's the homework, do it, and when you're through, I'll come look at it. The, then the message is, you're expected to perform at this level. Well, that's the message that middle and upper income white kids get all the time from their parents. It's not the message that minority and poor kids get, typically. So to the extent that we can get that across better, you improve education, that's where the return on that, and some of these World Bank studies have got into that too, we see returns, when I say we, let me say they, they report returns of 43% if the additional education spending is targeted on uh, low income and hard to educate children own such things as class size reduction, teacher quality improvements, these things. So it, it really does matter how you spend it. And the things that really show up are class size first and foremost, uh, teacher quality about the same, most of the other things not nearly as much. Are you saying the message of expectations counts for more than the extra dollar? Yes, but to get the message, if, if you could, if you gave me enough dollars to hire somebody to follow the kid around, tell them I expect you to do this. And it, it's just that the, the, the dollars don't matter at all. If I've got a fifth grader sitting here, the, the dollars don't matter at all. The size of the class matters. Uh, the quality of the teacher matters. The facility itself matters. Those things matter. And it just happens they're associated with the dollars spent. Other questions? I think we have a question online. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> question from a viewer online is, uh, I like how you explained how money invested in education reduces the cost of health care. With that in mind, what specific areas in our public school system would you invest in and why? Also, can you see a more applicable skill set curriculum being adopted by the public schools at this time as it appears to be back on its legs? As, I'll, I'll take it from the back end first. Uh, yes, I have hope that we will improve, let me not be so bold as to say improve, that we will modify our curriculum to areas that are actually more productive towards achieving student output and uh, the gains that they make, not just on certain selected tests, but more broadly on the life skills that I think we intuitively know make a difference. Uh, I, I think the evidence is starting to become clear to a lot of people that look at that. That's what matters. When we look at the uh, traditional systems that we've been funding with for the last few years, we're seeing that much of that simply does not matter to most students that we've been uh, not gaining towards our ends, but rather possibly even going away from them. And at the very least, not focusing on the things that matter to the students for their long-term uh, productivity standpoint and their ability to compete and simply to be effective students and, and citizens. I, as an economist, tend to talk about the economic gains they get from it, but that, of course, is only, I'm, I'm continually reminded by my uh, education major friends, that's only one aspect of why you go to school. There's also the good citizen standpoint, the more effective voter standpoint, the, uh, the fact that you're just a general, better, good person to be around standpoint. I prefer to be around people that have higher education because they tend to have a little more to talk about. So there are a lot of qualities to it in addition to uh, the straight economic part, but the economic part tends to be the easiest to measure. We are seeing a lot of, a lot of states are exploring alternative curriculums that tend to address some of the concerns that uh, the, the more narrowly focused curriculums <clears throat> don't do as much and as well as what uh, a lot of parents demand and what the broader community seems to demand of the school system. So I think, 
I'm optimistic I'm seeing changes in that area. And as the economy turns around, as it must someday, you can only stay down so long, it won't get back to the robust pace it had for a while, but it will turn around eventually. I don't want to be over pessimistic on that. When it does, I think we have enough improved knowledge to do things better next time. And that's my real, that's my hope and message to everyone in this room is work to ensure that your systems of funding any public service, whether it's education, whether it's corrections, whether it's streets and roads, make sure that it's revisited, reconsidered, thought through the best way possible so that when you have to tax people that you can assure them that you're spending that money the best way it can possibly be spent, getting the highest return, whether it's a different curriculum for education, whether it's a more efficient road system. Uh, e efficiency is the name of the game. That's what we have to be able to assure taxpayers if we expect their support in the future. Any other questions? Please comment. Uh, we thank you so much for your presence. Thank, thank you, you so much. Very much for